Hi everyone, we will be starting in a couple of minutes. Kindly requesting you all to remain muted throughout the call and please do not draw on the screen. Thank you. My internet is a little slow, so just give me two minutes, please. Hello everyone. My name is Shiv Kapoor. I'm in the 12th grade at Head Start Educational Academy, Bangalore. My sister Tara and I would like to thank you all for joining today. We saw this lockdown as a great opportunity to help students by bringing professionals from various domains to expose us to a spectrum of careers. Today, we will be hosting Professor Anusha Chari, a professor of economics and finance, as well as a director of the Modern Indian Studies Initiative at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is also a research associate in the National Bureau of Economic Research, International Finance and Microeconomics Program, and a research fellow at the Reserve Bank of India. Professor Charlie received a PhD in International Finance from UCLA and a BA in philosophy, politics, and economics mm -hmm. at Balliol College at Oxford and economics at the University of Delhi. She has held faculty positions at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, the University of Michigan, and the Haas School of Business at Berkeley. She is a special advisor to the Indian Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council and a member of an advisory, advisory group of eminent persons of G20 issues. Before we let Professor take over, we would like to inform you all about our housekeeping rules. 
Firstly, kindly keep yourselves muted and keep your videos off for the entire duration of the session. Secondly, shall our speakers share screen? Kindly do not annotate or draw on her screen. And lastly, any questions you have for the speaker can be sent to us in the chat box. We will use the second half of this session to pose your questions to the professor. Thank you. And professor, you may take over from here. Thank you so much, Shiv and Tara, for inviting me to this very enterprising career talk series. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen now and walk you through uh, a little bit of, um, hang on one second, uh, of a career in economics. And at the end, I hope that you will take this opportunity to ask me uh, questions. So uh, let's start. Um, so the first thing I would like is to ask you all a question. And don't think too much about this. Just think about what are the words or word that comes to mind when someone says economist. So what I'd like you to do is I would like you to write this in the chat box and I would like Shiv to share this with me to see what are the words that you can write down. So it could just be one word or many words. So why don't you quickly write down what comes to mind when you think of an economist. So I'm getting some great so, words here. Yeah, so allocator of limited resources, statistics, money, finance, London School of Economics, choices, insurance, stocks, accounting, somebody who makes policies at the government level, an expert in economics, a professor, market correction. Okay. So I think we have a very good list of words and hopefully we're going to touch on some of these as we go through the talk. But I want to say that this group has, right off the bat, has a much more positive view of economics because when this question has been asked to students in uh, North America, um, a number of uh, the words that come up are Economics is boring, it's geeky, it's dry, it's complicated, it's irrelevant, and worse still, economists are out of touch, aloof, and economics is not for people like me. So if you go into the general public, um, you know, you might come across words like this, but this group certainly seems is, 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 is an exception because you all have a very different uh, view of economics. So that makes me happy. So I have a question, which is what do former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and Shah Rukh Khan have in common? And let you think about it for a second. If anyone quickly wants to write something in the chat, they can. Exactly. So Arjun um, and Dia and Vijaya, both all three of you are exactly right that all both of them have undergraduate and um, of course, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh has a PhD uh, in economics. So if you just look at the screen, I've just put up the different walks of life and the different professions where people have actually uh, got bachelor's or other degrees in economics. So you're not, you wouldn't probably be too surprised to see business leaders on there. So Ajaypal Singh, who's uh, Ajaypal Singh Banga, who's the CEO of 
and president of MasterCard. Um, he has an economics background. And so if we look at the business world, uh, you have Warren Buffett, uh, you have um, Steve Ballmer, you have Meg Whitman, William Harrison, Ted Turner, Scott McNally, Sam Walton, um, Maya, Masayoshi Sun. Uh, these are all people in the business world uh, who have economics backgrounds, but you also see a fair number of politicians. So I didn't put down uh, Gerald Ford, but Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, um, as well as Donald Trump uh, and Ivanka Trump all had undergraduate degrees. You have Kofi Annan, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations. He had an economics degree, as did Sandra Day O'Corner, who was a US Supreme Court judge. And then just for fun, I put down some actors. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, who went on to have a career in politics, but Kate Blanchett, Paul Newman, Danny Glover, Laura Datta, who was Miss Universe, um, and, and also uh, a fashion designer, Diane von Furstenberg. So you can see that there is a very broad range of careers that people in economics uh, can go on to have. And today I'm going to talk you through a little bit of what this might entail. So Shiv did a very nice job of introducing me, so I'm not going to take up more of your time. But you can see that um, you know he went over my education, my current position. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that not only am I a research fellow at the Reserve Bank of India, but because of the work that I do in macroeconomics, I'm invited by central banks around the world, which is the RBI equivalent in other countries, including the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Korea, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the Bank of Mexico, uh, the central banks of Argentina and Chile and so on. So because I'm an international economist, um, I have associations with all these organizations around the world. Um, and I've also done um, a sort of a, a, a research fellow stint at the Swiss Institute of Banking and Finance and the IMF. And my research interests primarily relate to financial markets and in particular financial markets in emerging economies. And I focus on the effects of financial globalization. So in a nutshell, what is financial globalization? If countries remain closed to each other, uh, that means that not only can trade not flow across borders, but also financial capital. Financial globalization entails opening up markets to foreign investors so that foreign investors can invest in stock markets, bond markets, foreign direct investment, and so on um, across countries. So if I wanted, I could buy shares in Sony in Japan or Reliance in India or any, you know, a lot of companies around the world. And that was not always the case uh, till about, you know, the late 80s, early 90s that's when countries really started opening up and capital started flowing across borders. I also study international mergers and acquisitions and I have a uh, research agenda in, 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 um, on the Indian economy. So uh, what I'd like to do in this talk is to begin by telling you a little bit about what do economists do what kinds of questions do economists ask? What tools do they use to answer these questions? And what careers follow after an economics degree? And then we'll end with a little bit of how much does a typical economist earn? And um, this is going to be from a US perspective, but it just sort of gives you an idea of the ranking of um, economist jobs uh, in, in across, uh, in economy. So that ranking, uh, we sort of see that um, actually also holding up in other countries. So what are the questions that economists ask? Some of you brought up important points about financial markets, insurance, the stock market, and so on. But economists also try to answer some very 
fundamental question about why some countries are rich and some countries are, are poor, which essentially points to what are the factors that make some countries grow? And in particular, will countries grow faster if they implement and sustain certain types of reforms? So can governments implement policies that will help countries grow faster? And if they can, can we pinpoint what these policies are? And how do we go about judging whether these policies and reforms are successful? We basically have to bring data and statistical methods to bear on trying to answer these questions. Other fundamental questions are, well, it's all very well for countries to grow, but is this income equally distributed across different strata in economies, or do we see a lot of income inequality, which is basically uh, a few people in the economy are doing very well, but vast swaths of the population are very poor. So how do countries line up uh, when we think about income inequality? Once again, we can bring data and models to bear to answer these questions. From a business perspective, economics also offers many tools to try and understand how do firms maximize profits? What is the competition analysis that they would need to do? How can they combine labor inputs, which is workers, and capital inputs, which is factories and machinery, uh, to maximize profits by using the best technology that is available to them? How do they see what their competitors are doing? How can they gain market advantage? So from a business industry perspective, industrial organization is a field of economics that helps us understand uh, answers to some of these questions, once again, by providing analytical models and bringing data and statistics to bear. At the household level, we are using economics all the time. So let me sort of give you a quick example. Let's suppose I'm assuming, given that most of you are in high school, that you're not drinking coffee yet but perhaps your parents do, and maybe some of you do as well. So when you go into a Starbucks or a Costa Coffee or a, um, or a coffee day, what are, what are the choices you make in terms of buying a cup of coffee? Why did you choose a latte or a cappuccino versus a filter coffee? Did you sm choose a smaller size and add an additional shot of espresso? Did you bring a reusable cup or a loyalty card to get a discount? Why didn't you get a tea? Or why didn't you just make it at home? So we might just think of this as getting a little bit of caffeine early in the morning, but in all of these decisions, individuals, your parents, yourself, you're applying some economic reasoning. And what is that economic reasoning? You weight up the costs against the benefits along with what are your preferences and what are the incentives? Is Starbucks giving you an incentive to buy a bigger cup of coffee? Is it cheaper if you get a bigger cup of coffee? And you've weighed all of these economic choices in order to make the best decision for yourself. So the other questions are things like, I've mentioned data. So there's a lot of data analysis or data science that goes into economics and helping us understand the world. And what I'd like to do now is to just show you a very quick video about a common myth about economics. Economists from around the globe to discuss their research. My name is Giorgio Presidente. I'm Alexa Preyman. I'm Fabian Kreimer. Brittany Wiltshire. But before we let them go, we had one final question for each of them. What was one myth about the economics profession that they wanted to dispel? Yeah, I love this question. In my experience, there is one false myth about economists. Uh, there are some myths about uh, being an economist out there. Um, I think my favorite myth is that 
economists are just all about money. They primarily think that I work in finance. With my family, they all think that I work in finance. To someone that deals with monetary policy, interest rates, banks. If, you know, like stock exchange. The first question is, oh, so how's the stock market doing? They all ask me for stock tips. People ask, ask me what stocks they should buy in them. Which stocks should I bank on? Well, probably the only reason for us to exist is to predict the stock prices. Because we're still in love. It's not my real house. I would love stock tips too. Unfortunately, we're actually doing a very poor job at that. Uh, they must confuse what we study with the business studies or they're taking us as an entrepreneurs. Uh, we know that that's unfortunately not the case. It is a myth. It's not how we do things. We study people making choices. So I like to think of economics as the study of how people make decisions under scarce resources, such as time and money. Economics is actually the study of behavior and decision making, right? So you actually can find a lot of economists who study the topics of crimes, health, and education too. Health implications of indoor air pollution. We are doing economics every day, whether we think of it or not. Um, even deciding who does what chores in your household is an economic decision. Me, you making choices on what we're going to do in our lives. Economists use mathematical models and statistical analysis to, again, model or to analyze this decision making and how incentive structures change this decision making. So what we're studying is kind of the millions, billions of people making choices in their lives based on their own personal values. And then what happens when all these people rub elbows my friends, my colleagues who I have met in the professions, a lot of them actually come into economics because they care deeply about social issues. Economists have broadened their, uh, their interests and their work beyond just pure monetary outcomes. Economics is everywhere, and in fact, the field really does encourage niche and creative research topics. The tools that we learn in, in economics are useful for understanding uh, societal problems. So hopefully you found that video illuminating, but let me just sort of summarize some of what we saw over there by talking about how economics can be defined. So economics can be defined in a few different ways. And as the economists on the video mentioned, it is the study of scarcity. Of course, we would all love unlimited resources, but we know that this is not uh, realistic. And most of the time, we have to make decisions based on limited resources. And therefore, economics studies how people re use resources and respond to incentives or the study of decision making. So it definitely involves topics like wealth and finance, but it's not all about money. It's a very broad discipline that helps us understand historical trends or what we can learn from past episodes of say financial crises. How do we interpret today's headlines? If we open up our textbook, our newspapers, or, or sign into the news, how do we make, make uh, try and interpret or make sense of what the inflation numbers are, what unemployment is, what interest rates are, how the economy is growing, and as well as using all of this and statistics to make predictions about the coming year. So for example, India is the fifth largest economy in the world, but predictions or forecasts using data suggests that in about five to 10 years, it might be the third or fourth largest economy in the world. So how do we make these predictions? And economics ranges from the very small or micro individual to the very large, which is the economy as the whole or the world economy. And so the study of indiv individual decisions, whether they be by people or firms is called microeconomics, where the study of the economy as a whole is called macroeconomics. So a microeconomist might focus on a family's credit card debt, uh, whereas a macroeconomist might focus on sovereign debt. So 
what do economists do? They use these mathematical models with statistical analysis or empirical data to evaluate programs, such as if we start offering school lunches, will free school lunches, will attendance in rural schools go up? Study human behavior. Why do some people save a lot, whereas others don't? Explain social phenomena. And therefore, economics often intersects with many disciplines, and they include social sectors like health or education, but also environment, gender, immigration, which is the flow of people across borders. So I'm not going to get a chance because we don't have that much time, but I have included this link. And if you're interested after this talk, what you can do is you can go to this website and there are many, many different types of short videos that will give you a sense of what ec economists do and what you can hope to get out of an economics undergraduate degree. So let me sort of go to this question directly, which is to say, I want to study uh, economics, but what are you gonna do with an economics major? What can a background in economics prepare you for? And where are the jobs? And what are the skills? We've already talked a little bit about these skills, but what are the kinds of skills that are most important for students who want to pursue a career in economics? So the American Economics Association points to five broad areas that draw econ majors. So people who have an undergraduate degree in economics. So this is the corporate world where you see econ majors getting jobs in management, finance, or sales positions. And eventually, a lot of econ majors go on to get an MBA. Economic consulting draws a lot from econ majors simply because e econ majors are trained in using analytical models and statistical methods to analyze data. So if an economic consultant is called into a company where profits are lagging, you want people with an analytical mindset and the ability to use statistics and data to help the company figure out why their profits are lagging, for example. So economic consulting firms like McKinsey and so on seek econ majors to analyze data and develop economic models. You might be a little bit surprised, but there is a big intersection between law and economics, and econ majors are also consistently amongst the highest scoring students on the LSAT, which is the law school admission test. Government and nonprofit work, um, the Federal Reserve, which is the RBI equivalent, you might be surprised, the CIA, the World Bank, the IMF, international institutions, all of these agencies employ economists. And finally, people like myself who are in academics and research, who teach and conduct research and try to make important contributions to the field of economics. So if we look at academic postings and listings from around the world, we'll see employers as diverse as eBay, Yahoo, Google, Amazon, uh, departments of state, labor, and treasury, central banking agencies, large commercial banks like Bank of America or Chase Manhattan, um, the Census Bureau, which is a government agency, and even the American Dental Association. So the point here is that the analytical skills and statistical methods that you become familiar with and are trained in with an economics undergraduate make you very desirable for a very wide range of employers who are looking precisely for those skills. So in summary, what do employers look for? They look for uh, people with strong quantitative skills, and when I'm talking about mathematical models, it's not like you have to be an economic, uh, a mathematical genius. 
This is not as hard as a math undergrad, but you do use mathematical skills to try and solve problems. Um, and oftentimes what you will see is after getting an econ undergraduate degree, students may need to pursue advanced degrees to qualify for many of the jobs in the private sector, such as MBAs. And, you know, as time has gone on, um, you know, strong computer skills, attention to detail, and an ability to communicate well are also important. You see this in uh, consulting firms, in um, investment banks, you see this in government and nonprofit agencies. And this is basically because the work that economists do does involve analyzing data and conducting research, no matter what type of job you end up getting, whether it be in consulting or in finance or in the government, uh, and then you need to be able to communicate this. Increasingly, we are seeing a lot of joint majors, which is computer science and econ, because the combination of computer science and econ is increasingly being required, especially in financial markets, investment banking jobs, commercial banking jobs. And it, it you know, I don't have to say that all of these skills are also necessary for a teaching career in economics. So let me talk a little bit, hang on, I need to go back, about economists um, as business leaders. And what we see is that a thorough knowledge, so Princeton Review in 2006 said a thorough review um, in a thorough not working knowledge of how economics shapes businesses is necessary if you're going to become a CEO one day. Bachelors in economics have a greater likelihood of becoming an S&P 500, that's the, uh, the uh, US index CEO, than any other major, including business administration and engineering. Common reasons given for the de desirability of economics uh, undergraduates is their problem solving skills, uh, their knowledge of markets, and their big picture perspective. The findings also show that there's a large percentage of CEOs who are econ majors who sub subsequently complete a graduate degree, which is often an MBA. So now let's think about, well, what does an economics degree, what are the career earnings? And these are median annual wages for economists. So what is the median um, earnings for people in economics in top five industries employing economists? And this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is in the US. And you can see that in finance and insurance, it's about $118,000. In the federal government, it's about 119000 um, and it sort of ranges uh, between about 118,000 and 70,000. And this is median, uh, which means that 50% earn more, 50% earn less. Um, and payscale.com has a list of majors that pay you back, and we can see where uh, economists, stacks, uh, e e economists stack up. So petroleum, if you're, this is a starting salary, right? So this is right out of an undergraduate degree and maybe one or two years into, the, uh, into your job or your career. Petroleum in engineering is about 94,000. Electric, electrical engineering is about 88,000. Applied economics and uh, management is about 58,900. And once again, these are median starting salaries um, and, and a, a across a range of disciplines. And then the second column basically shows us mid-career, which is five to 10 years into being um, in, in, in your profession. So let me sort of summarize by saying that uh, economics, a career in economics is much more than you think. And this is a a brief educational video developed by the American Economic Association, which will be inter of interest to students if you've ever wondered about what are the different types of fields 
that have used economics. So I'm just going to show this to you for a few minutes because it goes on for about eight minutes, but I'd really like you to see this uh, once we are done with this, with this um, talk. Many people have misconceptions about economics. I think the people closest to you hear that you're studying economics and they might say, what, what stock should I invest in? If you haven't had a chance to study economics before, the closest thing you probably think of is an accountant. Um, some people think that the field is like highly mathematical and that only people who are like Albert Einstein's protege can succeed in the field. One of the biggest misconceptions about economics is due to the highly publicized nature of Federal Reserve's monetary policy and Congress's fiscal budgets. And though some economists are very involved with financial markets and whatnot, economics to me, as I explained, is just much, much broader than that. Economics is about people. Okay, so why don't I stop now and take some of your questions, but you can, um, I'd, I'd like you to watch this video uh, in your free time. Uh, just give me a second, just collating the questions. There are quite a few. Um, so guys, um, for those who are interested in watching the videos, uh, I will share the links on the WhatsApp groups after the call. I can also share my PowerPoint with you. So then you can all, you'll have it all in one place. Okay, that would be great if you can do so, Professor. So, yeah. so Professor, we will be asking one question at a time. I will be asking on their behalf and then you can answer them. So the first question is how important is math to a career in economics? So I would say that a career in math, a, a, a background in math is definitely, um, definitely needed because a lot of our analytical tools are use mathematical constructs, right? So calculus is used, algebra is used, um, and, then, and then we also use statistics. So, but as, as somebody in that video said, you don't need to be a math genius to do economics. Even if you have a high school level of uh, math, so if you understand a high school math, uh, you, should be, you should do just fine, right? So a lot of us, that's what we have. We have high school math, and then maybe in your undergraduate, you might supplement, uh, if you go to a liberal arts school, um, you might supplement with a little more math, but pretty much high school math is what you need, um, uh, calculus and algebra. What are the pros and cons one should consider when choosing between a BSc in eco and a BA in eco? So BSc in Eco and BA in Eco, this is just a question of how uh, universities classify uh, economics, right? So bachelor's uh, BA in Eco is if the, um, if the econ degree is considered to be part of arts, which is the social sciences. But because of its heavy use of math and statistics, um, economics is often classified as a STEM field. What is STEM? Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
So when economics gets classified as a STEM field, depending on the school, uh, then what you end up getting is a bachelor of science. So I'll just tell you at UNC, we have recently reclassified our econ degree as a bachelor of science because once you have a STEM degree, a lot of countries consider these as very essential uh, skills that they need and it becomes easier uh, for people to market their skills if they come from a STEM background. The next question is, is it difficult for a pure math bachelor degree person to catch economics in the post-graduation? Absolutely not. That's a great and I'm really glad you asked it because my choice was really to do either a BA in math or a BA in econ. I ended up going into a BA in econ, but if you have a BA in math, it sets you up very nicely to do graduate school in economics. Because then what happens is you've had all this extra math. So the initial math part is very easy for you and you're very familiar with the techniques and you can easily focus at that stage in trying to learn the economic intuition. So a number of my colleagues in my PhD, for example, came from math backgrounds or funnily enough, engineering backgrounds. So there are a lot of engineers undergraduates who go on to get PhDs and advanced degrees in economics. The next question is, what are some of the computer programming tools one would require to get into the field of research in economics? So at the moment, so this changes, right? So when I was getting my degree, there were different computer programs. But right now, I would say things like Python, because we're doing a lot of big data analysis that's becoming very popular in economics. So Python, R, and so on. So these are some of the statistical programs that, that are used uh, math um, and, um, and uh, that a MATLAB that's used for a lot of the programming. Stata is used for a lot of the statistical analysis. But Python is, 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 is increasingly very, very uh, popular. And as I mentioned, if you have, you know, you can come into and be doing an econ major. And if you take courses in computer science in parallel, that can also be very helpful if you're trying to get a job afterwards. What is your opinion on the field of consulting and what skills do you feel are necessary? So I gave you one example of what uh, consulting firms are looking for. So what do economic consultants do? They go into companies which are trying to change something, right? They're either trying to increase their sales, they're trying to figure out why they are lagging behind their competitors, they're wondering whether they can take their existing workforce and um, employ them in a more productive way? Are there ways in which we can increase our profits? Or they're trying to launch new products and they're trying to figure out what their niche might be. Uh, they're trying to figure out opportunities in the market. And so on the one hand, economic consultants work very closely with firms to analyze um, uh, develop analytical models to analyze these questions and to answer them. And as I mentioned, a lot of times if you have to do competitor analysis, what, are my, what is my competition in my industry doing? You're going to need to use data to figure out what's going on. If you're trying to enter a new market, you're going to need to know that. But economic consultants also work closely with governments. So governments that are trying to implement uh, sort of changes in education, in the school system, in their hospital systems, um, you know, economic consultants get invited into a very, very wide array of, of industries and fields. And really the common denominator is their problem solving skills, bringing analytical thought to solving problems and clearly explaining potential solutions to their clients. So the next part of the question was, what are some of the skills you feel are required? Required for what? Um, consulting. 
So I, I just mentioned them, right? So it's analytical skills, mathematical uh, or mathematical analytical problem solving orientation, the ability to do data analysis. And also uh, importantly, um, you know, be able to extract the big picture, right? And be able to present that good communication skills because oftentimes consulting firms have to present their findings and communicate their findings to top levels of management. So excellent communication skills um, is another requirement. So one thing, I don't know if, if this has come up, but if you guys get an opportunity or have, uh, have not had an opportunity, I would highly recommend doing a public speaking class. So, you know, if you're doing debating, you get some of that, but it's really important to be able to speak clearly and communicate. Um, and that's something that I advise all of my students to do is to take some sort of public speaking course. Our next question is, could you suggest some summer economics readings for incoming freshmen? Um, sure. I mean, I, 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 you know, one thing if you haven't read about, which is a fun book, is Freakonomics. But I can put together a list of five or ten readings for you guys and uh, send it to Shivantara. Okay, guys, so we'll share them on the group once we have it in our hands. Our next question is, what level of competence do you need in computer science to club it with economics? So I think you need, um, so I'll tell you why you need computer science, because it used to be that in investment banks, you had the MBAs who were the in the front office. They would be doing all the deals, they would be handling the clients, and they would uh, be doing all the business development and client relations parts of the job. So basically, these were MBAs who looked good in suits, and they were in the front of the front in the front part. And in the back offices, you had the physicists and the hardcore what they call quant jocks, who are basically people who are very very good at computer science and mathematical modeling. But increasingly, what's happened is that you really need to be able to extract data and do data analysis. Um, and in order to do that, given the fact that we're dealing with so much big data, right? You just have so much data to, um, to kind of work with. Uh, you almost need a data scientist in order to be working in an investment bank. And so that is the level of computer science knowledge you need which is, would you be able to go in and quickly write a program to extract data? And would you be a comfortable enough with computer, computer um, uh, science modeling uh, in order to do data analysis? So it's not like you're going into a tech field. That's not the level of competence you need, but you, you know, a few courses in computer science. And that's what we're seeing at our school is that a number of students do these double majors in uh, economics and computer science, which is they would have five or six or seven courses in computer science. The next question is, in your observation, is economics a popular field among women? That's a great question. And it's actually something that I've been working on is that traditionally economics has been very male dominated. And a lot of the work I'm doing on uh, is these days, which is not related to my international finance work, uh, is related to improving the representation of women in economics. So I have a lot of female PhD students and I'm constantly talking and doing research on trying to understand why there aren't that many women in the field. I think uh, some women get turned off in the US by the very male dominated environment. Some women get turned off because they don't like math, which I don't understand because I love math. Um, and um, so there are a variety of reasons. The other thing is there's some myth about women don't like making money and women like to help people. And so they end up working in education or health or something like that. And, you know, men end up going into financial markets. And that's a complete myth. Um, it's not that women are not interested in, in, in wealth accumulation or making money. And I just think that more women need to come into economics because they bring different perspectives and economics suffers if there isn't diversity. 
the next question is how difficult is it for someone to study in a completely different stream so that's a very good question right like nothing is written in stone in my um in my opinion um you can always if you decide to do something so i know some people who were like political science undergraduates and they had a little bit of economics a little bit of math but they didn't actually hadn't done economics right they'd been doing something completely different um so then what we recommend to these students is take a year and uh build up your math skills let's say you don't have maths uh because you do need the math so take a year and build take a few courses in mathematics and now you can do a lot of this online as well take a few courses in mathematics and statistics so that you have the analytical toolkit and then you can go into say uh say you already have an undergraduate degree you can go in and get a, a masters degree in 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 uh economics but in order to do that you would really need to tool up in terms of your math and statistics skills what do universities look for in an economics applicant um so i think um i'm saying this again sort of analytical skills um and problem solving skills and the background right so you need the math and the statistics in the background but what they're also looking for is what are the kinds of questions you want to answer with economics and that is why i would sort of try and think a little bit outside the box of just financial markets and stock markets and go and look at that link that i'm going to send you from the american economic association and look at the very different uh types of questions and fields ranging from mobile banking to um education and health that um you know economists use our tools to answer these questions so something like trying to solve a important problem either in the economy or in a society like the environment people are there are a lot of people who are now studying environmental economics so something that shows that you're thinking about the world's big problems what are our major challenges at the moment and how you think you can use economics uh to solve that so if you can show that you are creative in thinking about economics um and you have the kind of math and statistical background i think that colleges would find that type of application very interesting something unusual so our next question is regarding colleges in general what are some shifts feel will happen due to covid-19 um in in what so in terms of colleges and applications acceptance yeah. rates yeah so right now unfortunately we are living in a world of deglobalization and there's a lot of sort of anti immigrant sentiment in the US for example um and also in the UK and so on so um you know because of covid-19 for example we're 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 having a very hard time getting visas right all the visas have stopped so um i think that the next year is going to be very challenging but i think after that i think you know i i foresee that um you know things will come back to normal so professor we have around 10 minutes left and quite a few questions left so maybe do a rapid fire or a quick response round okay so our next question is would a double major in economics maths and a minor in comm science be a, the ideal option for someone looking to do a career in economics i think that would be a winning combination can a pure math person find it easy to learn actuarial science absolutely how important is accounting to become an e- economist i you know if you end up doing finance so that's another thing i i i didn't mention that that you know um there are a lot of undergraduate uh people with undergraduate degrees in economics who go on to get a masters in accounting 
accounting. So you don't need accounting coming into economics, but it definitely feeds into accounting and um, actuarial science and so on. Actually, I have a PhD student right now who, whose background is actuarial, actuarial science. So the next question is more general, which is in the current situation, more people are losing their jobs. How has this affected economists? So I think economists are lucky we're, we're not losing our jobs. Uh, just because that's one thing I want to point out is that the more skills you have, um, the harder it is for you to lose your job. So I'm, I'm a professor. I have tenure, so I have job security. But um, um, economists, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see that it's the low skill workers, the restaurant workers, the people who work in low skill service jobs who are the ones who are asymmetrically hurt by this crisis or any sort of recession those are the those are the people who end up losing their losing their jobs what are some traits you find in finance and basically finance students and finance majors um, they tend to be confident uh, they tend to be very hard working uh, they tend to be very diligent. So, you know, whenever I teach my undergraduates in business and finance, um, they're just very, very impressive people in terms of their knowledge of current affairs, their dedication to learning about finance. They do internships and they're very dynamic. And I think that's one thing. I, one word would be go-getter uh, if I was to use um, uh, you know, an adjective for a finance undergraduate. Um, and that's one thing I want to just say that you shouldn't be shy, you know, don't, don't sit back. If you want something, go for it. Um, that's one, one piece of advice I wish that I had been given when I was your age that don't, don't hold back, just go for it. What is one skill you would tag to becoming a successful economist? Could you discuss a little about international business and economics? Sure. You know, a lot of my work is on, um, you know, globalization and multinational corporations and how the nature of production when I was growing up, you know, different countries just produce their own goods and all of their own goods and they just traded a little bit, especially developing countries like India. But now we just value chains, which means that the nature of business has essentially become global. So if you look at Apple's, um, you know, production of an iPhone, it's, you know, there are dozens of countries that are supplying different parts of the input that's finally put together, starting with, you know, the design and intellectual property in the U.S., the semiconductors come from the chips come from Korea, the assembly takes place in China. And that's just one one example um, you know, uh, production is inherently global and therefore business is in inherently international in today's day. We're seeing some waves of resistance to this with the anti-immigration sentiment, the anti-trade sentiment, but the way that production is organized is increasingly becoming that or has become that. And that's the world you are going to live in. So with that, okay, there's one last question. Other than an MBA in finance, which are the other fields that you would suggest for finance students? I, one thing I suggest is getting a master's in finance. Um, it's cheaper than getting an MBA. Um, it's, you know, usually a year you can get. Some schools have a year. There are lots of schools that have very good masters in finance or financial engineering or different kinds of finance related masters. So if you don't want to get a full fledged MBA, uh, that is definitely a way to go. Okay, my apologies. One last question is coming. Okay. In countries like India, how can microeconomics help even the last person in the value chain? Can you give examples? Absolutely. I mean, if you think about this year's Nobel Prize that went to Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, all of their work has to do with microeconomics. 
they're studying um, uh, social issues, they're studying school attendance in rural areas, the delivery of healthcare, um, you know, mobile banking, all of these fields. And once again, I really encourage you to look at some of those videos. All of these are related to delivering services and helping the last person in the value chain to prosper. Because that is fundamentally what economics is trying to do, is to use scarce resources to help countries grow and for everyone to prosper. Okay, so for some reason we have one more question in, if you're okay answering it. Sure. What is the best choice for final year students like finance and banking or accounts and taxation? Um, are, are you asking me to choose between the two? Uh, no, Wait. the question is, actually, yeah, I think it's a question regard, regarding the choice. So um, I have to say that you, you can't really go wrong. I can, I, it really depends on your preference. If you like accounting, it's a very, very relevant field. It's something that's always in demand. Um, account, uh, you know, people in accounting firms like Ernst & Young and so on, they make extremely good, um, um, sort of, they earn very well. The same thing with finance and banking. One thing I might say is that accounting might be a little more stable because finance, sometimes, you know, as the market goes up and down or you have a crisis or a financial market crisis, you know, there can be sort of layoffs and so on. So whereas accounting is kind of a stable uh, sort of field, but it really depends on what your preferences and what you want to do in terms of your in terms of your job. Okay, so with that, we will conclude today's session. On behalf of all our viewers today, we would like to talk. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Professor, for giving us your precious time. I would also like to thank you all viewers for joining us today. Before you log out, just a quick reminder that our next talk is on 28th of June at 9 p.m. with Mr. Vivek Mittal on renewables and finance. Thank you, Shiv. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye.